Hello again. It's uh, Joseph Becker with the Stanford International Emergency Medicine. Um, we're here to discuss fever and our case questions for the, uh, the fever case discussion. So without further ado, uh, we'll start with our case. And as you'll see in the uh, upcoming movie, this is a case initially about uh, two patients, Donna and Catherine. They are trauma patients, at least initially, uh, victims of what is, is supposedly a motor vehicle accident. Um, one of them presents uh, in critical uh, distress with altered mental state, and uh, we'll see how the rest of the case develops as we watch. So here we go. Okay, fellas, hit them. Let's go. Donna Gallagher, unrestrained teen driver, ejected with a car flip. Hit a jogger coming in on the next rig. GCS 7, VP 90 pounds. Rig, trauma one. Passenger has facial injuries from airbag and shoulder pain. Vital stable. Yeah, we think you got it. What's your name, sweetie? Kevin Ochaski. Oh, I feel ya. I used to be Abigail Wazinski. My friends call me Katie O. Donna, can you hear me? VP 75, systolic, pulse 130. How we doing in here? Nothing in the belly, no tampon on. Why is she hypotensive? Hypomosis on the thighs. Distal extremities, too. She's in DIC. She has to be hemorrhaging somewhere to cause DIC. All right, let's get her to the scanner. Oh, her IV sites are oozing. She needs platelets and FFP. No, not with this blood shortage. We can't give her a last platelet, she'll just chew them up. She's unresponsive, she's bleeding everywhere. She could have a head bleed. We don't know that. All right, can someone give me a gram of acetaminophen? Okay, so in that short clip we just watched there, you can see how the, these two patients had their care initially managed, uh, and several questions can be posed, the first of which is, what are the important actions uh, that can be uh, performed when evaluating an undifferentiated and critically ill patient? So very important, how do we initially approach a patient uh, who is critically ill? And then number two, the patient, Donna, appears to be in shock. What do the characters in this scene do to differentiate between the different causes of shock? So you can see there was a discussion there about the patient's blood pressure and the potential etiologies of that. And we can discuss what, they, what these characters did to determine what this patient's shock is from. Okay, moving on to the next video. Give me tablets, please. Secure her airway. Let's see what we find on CT. By then, it could be too late. Okay, Katie, you move your head from side to side. Does that hurt? It's just a little stiff. Okay. And I hurt all over. And your forearms are bruised up. I must have hit him on the dashboard or something. Now, do you remember what happened? Uh, we were at the mall. No school? It was the last day before spring break, so we cut. But Donna got a headache, and she said she wanted to go home. Okay. Okay, follow my finger. The light really hurts. The airbag could have scratched your cornea. BP 115 over 80, pulse 104. Hey, I'm gonna press on your abdomen. Let me know if this hurts. She fainted on the way home. I tried to stop the car, but I couldn't. Chest x-ray, shoulder series, icon UA, and visual acuity. I'll set up this little lamp. Thank you. And then the car was upside down. I looked over at Donna, but she wasn't there anymore. Okay, so as you saw the, the workup of both patients there progress, uh, an interesting question can be posed, and essentially is how can an emergency provider make the correct diagnosis in situations such as the one presented in this video? So as you might imagine, this is a discussion about fever, yet we have two trauma patients here. So it is uh, likely that there is something else going on here, and how, uh, when we present, when we provide care to emergency patients, how can we make the correct diagnosis given that the history and the characteristics of the uh, history that we often learn are, are often inaccurate or incomplete. All right, moving along to the next video. Did you reach my parents? They're on their way in, so are Donna. Is she okay? She's got some really good doctors taking care of her. Can I get something for my headache? Sure, temp is up, 101.8. Okay, 600 of ibuprofen. And about my bruises, when will they go away? They've spread. Yeah. Abby. Okay, Juni, put on a mask. All the lab for stat blood cultures hang two grams of stat triaxone. Ivy, make sure she stays in isolation. Don't worry, Mr. Highsmith, you'll be back jogging in no time. Luca! Yeah, time of death, 1217. It's meningococcemia. My patient has rapidly progressing purpur and fever, and I bet this one is too. It's 
DIC from trauma. Yeah, I don't think so. My girl complained of headaches, stiff neck, and sensitivity to light. I'll call infection control. I put her in isolation, start her on ceftriaxone. We need immediate prophylaxis for all hospital staff exposed to these patients. It's a lot of people. We're all at risk. Okay, so <clears throat> as we saw in this case, it seems to have developed in these uh, two initially uh, trauma patients are now thought to be suffering from meningococcal meningitis. So a couple of questions can be posed based on this new information. The first of which is, what is the role of the lumbar puncture in the diagnosis of meningitis? Uh, number five, is it necessary to wait for the results of the lumbar puncture before initiating antibiotic treatment? This is very important because as the lumbar puncture is the only way of establishing this diagnosis, if there are delays in its performance, does that also subsequently delay the provision of, of uh, antibiotics? Number six, this case seems to be one of Neisseria meningitidis bacterial meningitis. What other treatment can be provided in this case aside from the antibiotics already discussed? And number seven, why is it important to maintain universal precautions and be vigilant for diagnoses that require higher levels of isolation? So we'll discuss that a little bit as well. All right. Now, the next uh, several questions are going to be based on a second case, <clears throat> and this is another uh, case discussion of a patient with fever. And as we see in this case, this is a child who has fever and some upper respiratory uh, inf uh, infection symptoms as well as a fever of unknown etiology for some time now. So moving along to the video itself. All right. Okay, buddy, you're not feeling so great, huh? What's the temperature? 103. Okay, Carter, this is a good place for you to start. Why don't you come get me and present your findings? No problem. I'm going to listen to your chest. Okay, take a deep breath for me. <sighs> All right. So in this introductory clip, uh, we have the question number eight. This child appears to have a fever of unknown source and for a longer than usual duration. As we learned, this fever was present for about seven days. What broad differential diagnostic domains must be considered in this case? When we, when we approach a patient such as this, what do we need to consider? All right, and subsequent clip. So that's your diagnosis, that the kid has the flu. Viral syndrome, I prescribed fever control measures and fluids. Uh, he's got rash, conjunctivitis, swollen glands. How long has he had the fever? Uh, his mom said about a week. Fever of unknown origin for seven days. Did I miss something? What color is his tongue? Pink. Not strawberry? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. Did you notice his chapped lips? All right. So based on this clip, what differential diagnosis could be generated from the findings of the two providers in this clip? So. These, these two providers have been discussing several findings on the physical exam. What differential diagnosis can be generated based on this information? What mistakes uh, are made by the first provider in caring for this patient? So you can see the patient and the, the two providers discussing the case, and uh, the second provider seems to have some information that the first did not. All right, so moving on to the final clip. All right, give him an aspirin and order an echocardiogram. Aspirin? I thought you'd never give aspirin to a child. Unless, of course, he's diagnosed with Kawasaki's. Kawasaki's, um... Kawasaki's is a cluster of unremarkable symptoms that can lead to coronary aneurysm. Fever, chapped lips, and strawberry tongue are the tip-offs. Admit the boy to the PEDS unit. Right away. Okay, so following that final clip, uh, two questions. Um, number 11, what is Kawasaki's arteritis and how is it treated? And number 12, why is it important to make this diagnosis and differentiate between Kawasaki's and a simple febrile illness? All right, so these are the questions based on these two fever cases. Um, please uh, enjoy answering them and we will uh, welcome Dr. Mahadevan as our expert discussant for the fever case discussion upcoming. Thank you very much.